All right, we're back with our Mystery of Redemption. We're talking about chapter 10 today, Christ's Redemptive Resurrection. You might recall that what we've been looking at is what is it that we can learn about how Christ came to redeem us, how Christ came to save us, by looking at all the different aspects and elements of Christ's life. So we, we were looking at the infancy narrative and the birth of Christ, and then we moved through uh, to his hidden life and then to his public life as he began teaching and, and what the miracles that he worked, what that shows us about how Christ wants to save us. And then we looked last week at Christ's actual suffering and death on the cross and what that shows us about redemption and how he came to save us. And now we're looking at what we can learn about that from his resurrection. Right? What is it about the stories and the events and the things that surround his resurrection that can help us understand how it is that Christ redeems us and saves us? And so, um, first of all, we're going to look at the, the first event that we talk about right after his resurrection, or I'm sorry, right after his death, which is where we ended last week. After his crucifixion, we talk about in the creed, we talk about Christ after he dies on the cross, we say he descended into hell, Okay. Now let's look at what we mean by that when we talk about that. What we mean is that the gospel, Christ goes down to preach even to the dead, that though they are judged in the flesh like men, they might live in the spirit like God. Okay, so he, he goes down to preach to those who have already died. All the people that had died up to the point of his death, right, could not enter into heaven because they were not without sin, they were not perfect. So there is this place, and we, again, we want to look at this in a moment, but not quite like hell, but again, not heaven, right? A sort of place where the people were awaiting uh, something, right? We're awaiting uh, the good news. And so this was not the hell of eternal damnation, sorry, this was not the hell of eternal damnation, but the abode of the just who had died before the coming of Christ and were awaiting the promised redemption. Right? The grace of redemption is thus made available to every human person who ever lived or will live. There's a beautiful picture in an image, right, of this place where all the just were waiting, sort of in limbo, if you will. Uh, the, the Bible talks about it being as the Abraham or the bosom of Abraham, right? Different ways of just trying to describe this. But again, when Christ dies, this, this beautiful painting image is this. Christ comes to them, still with his cross, I think beautifully portrayed there in this, in this painting, comes and begins to bring the good news of the gospel to all of these people who had been locked out of heaven because of their sins and because of the sins of humanity, right? So in a sense, Christ goes to these people and presents to them the good news of the gospel and then gives them the opportunity, do you believe in this now? Right? Do you want to come into this eternal life that I've prepared for you, this eternal uh, place of, of joy and bliss that I've prepared for you? Christ extends to every person who had died up to this point in human history that opportunity and that option. So that's what we mean when we talk about Christ descending into hell, uh, descending into this place of waiting where people were, were sort of uh, uh, waiting for uh, the good, the, the good news of the, of the gospel. Okay. Now, St. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching has been in vain. Right? So when we talk about the resurrection, I think there's something really important for us to understand. Right? St. Paul makes this point too. Right? Really, everything that we believe, in a sense, now you can say that about a lot of things. You can say everything we believe is centered around the nativity and, the, and, the, and Christmas. Right? Everything we believe is centered around the cross. Right? Everything we believe is centered, and all of those things are true. But in a sense, St. Paul makes the claim that, look, if all that stuff had happened, but Christ doesn't, doesn't become resurrected, right? does not come back from the dead, if Christ doesn't do that, if Christ isn't resurrected, right, then he's saying everything that we have preached, everything that we believe, it's all in vain. It's all for naught. And I think that's really important. Everything centers in our faith around the fact that Christ resurrected from the dead. Lots of people have been crucified. Lots of people in the history of the world had preached and told everyone, I am God, or I am the Son of God. Right? So lots of people were out saying that, and they died, and we never heard from them again. Right? Lots of people have been crucified on the cross. Lots of good people. Right? Lots of good people have been crucified on a cross and killed, and we never heard from them again. Right? Christ had said he would be resurrected through his own power and through the, through the will of his Father, right? 
And so really then, if, it, if he doesn't come back from the dead, there's not really a whole lot to talk about. So everything really centers and hinges around the fact that Christ comes back from the dead on his own authority and on his own power. He conquers death. As St. Paul goes on to say, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sin. Right? Christ came and said, I will, I will destroy death. I will be three days and then I will be resurrected. Right? He talks about these things over and over again and we're going to look at that. If he was lying or it didn't actually happen, then we would all be in trouble. Right? There, all this stuff would be for naught. St. Paul, finally, if for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. If we walk around spending all of our life, right, oriented towards um, this, this hope that we have in heaven, now we believe, of course, that living out, living the way that Christ asks us to live also helps us in this life, but sometimes we struggle to see that. So a lot of times we're making decisions that, in, at least from our perspective in the short run, are really things that are hard to do, right? We're, our sacrifices, right? And so we make all these sacrifices to follow Christ. We give up our Sunday mornings. Now, we, again, we feel the joy and the peace that comes from that. And so that in, in one sense, we can kind of be motivated by that. But in another sense, like, if all these things that we do, all these sacrifices that we make to follow Christ, if, if, if Christ hasn't resurrected from the dead, then none of this stuff really makes any sense. We, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're just, we, we should be pitied, right? Because we're making all these sacrifices, and again, so this is uh, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians. All right. Let's look at the historical evidence for the resurrection of Christ. Okay? Now, one of, the, one of the things that, one of the pieces of historical evidence that we have for the resurrection of Christ is that he appears to many of his followers in the days following the resurrection. Right? So Christ is on earth for 40 more days after his resurrection. Okay? He won't ascend into heaven for 40 more days. So for 40 days, he appears to many of his followers, not just the disciples and the apostles. Right? So there are many appearances to his followers. And in fact, St. Paul notes that Christ appeared to about 500 people in his resurrected body. Okay? St. Paul says that he appear, Christ appears to 500 people uh, in his resurrected body. Really important here to note as well, when the Gospels and St. Paul's letters were written... These 500 people were still alive, almost, for the, for the vast majority of them, right? They had to still be alive, right? Because, again, the, the, St. Paul starts writing his letters not very far after, not very long after the resurrection. And certainly, these 500 people would have told their families, right? Their relatives. And so these stories would have been passed on. And so there would have been this huge number of people who would all have the same story and the same description, People who had no idea of each other, right? They might not have been, they weren't, some of them weren't related. They might not have even lived on the same side of town. They might have lived even in different cities, right? And yet, so we have this tidal wave. We have Jesus appearing to 500 different people. Those people all telling their friends and families, right, that this has happened and this is what it was like. And so these accounts and these descriptions of Jesus and his resurrection and what Jesus was saying are all being passed around by people and so we have, when the Gospels and St. Paul's letters were written, if they were making it up, people would have been like, no, that's not true. We know that that's not true because no one's actually talking about it. When the St. Paul's letters and the Gospels start to be written, everyone recognizes and hears in these things. They say, oh yeah, that's what everybody in the Middle East is talking about, right? Everybody in the Middle East is talking about these stories, right? It's, it's these guys' uncles and their grandparents People who are literally living, who, who when, when the Gospels are written and when the letters of St. Paul are being passed around, all the people that are hearing this, for the most part, are saying, you know what, I've heard that from 40 different other people, right, who all have said the same thing and who, who, who are all saying the same story and describing Christ in the same way and so forth. So there's this really powerful evidence of the resurrection is the fact that no one is saying, no, it's made up. Right? None of the followers, the only people who are saying that it's made up are the people who originally wanted Christ, to, who put Christ to death and wanted to stop his movement. Right? So some of the Jewish people who had put Christ to death, right, kept that, you know, they're, they're the only ones out there saying, no, this was made up. But the vast majority of people out there uh, have, the, there's this historical evidence for the resurrection of these people's stories. Uh, that's really important. Now, then a question becomes, again, let's continue this thought. 
was the resurrection made up? Right? That's really what it comes down to. I mean, it comes down to the resurrection. Was it made up or did it actually happen? Those are really the only two alternatives at this point. Right? Is th there's no third way here. Right? It's either Christ really did come back from the dead or Christ never came back from the dead. There's no kind of he came back from the dead. Okay, so either the resurrection is made up or it's real. Now, I think it's really important to say right here, if it was real, that means something. <laughs> For you and I, right? That makes us, we have to stop and, 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 and wrestle with that and say, wow, this is actually real. This is actually true. Because sometimes we struggle with that, right? We think, oh, I don't know if it's, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if it's real. I'm not sure if it's true. All that kind of stuff. There's a lot of proof when we sit down and look at it. There's a lot of stuff that helps us understand that they really could not have been made up, right? The resurrection could not have been made up. Blaise Pascal uh, said it this way talking about the apostles, right? And I think this is a great place to start because really they're the first ones whom the appearance has happened to. First of all, well, actually before the apostles, right? Mary Magdalene and some of the other women who run to the tomb, all right? But then, of course, so from there, they, the women go to the apostles. So let's just think about the apostles for a moment. Pascal says this, imagine these 12 men meeting after Jesus' death and conspiring to say that he has risen from the dead. So Peter gets, you know, Peter gets John and all the other apostles together and says, hey, uh, Jesus died and, um, you know, he never came back. So let's tell people that he was resurrected from the dead. Like, let's make all of this up, right? Now, Pascal says, the human heart is very susceptible to change, to promises, to bribery. When we're lying, the lies hardly ever last very long, right? People find out, even when it's just us, lying, right? With somebody else, we realize, oh, this was stupid to say this, right? Or someone, you know, maybe in another situation, like he says, people are susceptible to bribery. So Pascal says one of the apostles had only to deny their story under these inducements, okay? So people were literally torturing the apostles. People were literally paying the apostles and testing them. Will you recant your story? that Jesus resurrected? Will you take back your story that Jesus was resurrected? If you don't, we will put you to death, right? Or if you don't, or if you do, you know, we might reward you in this way or that. So they're being pulled in all these directions, being tempted to tell everyone, hey, we just made it up, right? They were being imprisoned. They were being tortured. They, put, they were all put to death, and they never once recanted it. Right? Now, why would you do that for a made-up story? Why would you and 11 people keep a secret for 50 years that caused all of you to be imprisoned, put to death, and tortured? Why would you do that? It makes zero sense. Right? The, the, the only reason that people typically lie or spread some kind of conspiracy is for their own benefit. Right? Maybe they're getting money out of it, or maybe, who knows, they get a book deal or whatever. But the apostles got none of that, right? They only, it only got worse for them. From the moment they see Jesus resurrected, it was basically downhill from there. Persecuted, traveling around, sacrificing, torture, and all of them put to death. This is another way of rephrasing it. The Gospels were written in such a time, they were written close in time to the events that they record. And so it would have been almost impossible to make up these stories. The fact that the disciples were able to proclaim the resurrection in Jerusalem in the face of their enemies a few weeks after the crucifixion shows that what they proclaimed was true, for they could never have proclaimed the resurrection and been believed under such circumstances had it not occurred. So again, we see after the Pentecost, the apostles go and start preaching the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ to the very people who are trying to put them to death, as we talked about before, right? These guys would not have been able to go out and start saying these things to people, A, because they wouldn't have had the courage to do it because they were, they were hiding, right, for a long time, and then finally the Holy Spirit gives them the power to go out and preach, right? The, 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 but then also, again, like we said, everybody in town would have known, Right? Hey, these guys are making this up. The only people that are telling the story are these 11 knuckleheads. But that's not what happens. People are hearing the apostles preach and they're saying, you know what? Betty, who lives down the street, she also 
as an experience of the resurrected Christ, and, and Christ came to her and told her, and she's been dramatically changed too. And then Betty starts telling, you know, the, the, the wave of evidence was just overwhelming, right? There's no way that these guys could have written these things down and had everybody believe them because everyone was around it. Everyone was knowing it and living it, right? So we have to take that into consideration. This was uh, done by a detective, right? There was a de I found, uh, found this online. Detective Jim Warner Wallace has been investigating and solving cold case homicides in California for over 25 years, okay? He says that there are successful conspiracies to make things up, so s successful conspiracies to, to hide or conceal something or make something up completely, share five common characteristics. Again, this is a detective who's been studying these things and is on TV a lot on, on uh, different shows, okay? One of the things that you need is a small number of conspirators, right? You need a small number of people who are going to be able to keep this story going and, 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 and so forth, right? These small number of people who are telling this lie need to have thorough and immediate communication so that as the story changes or new things happen, they can continue to stay on the same page. It needs to be over a short time span. Almost inevitably, when a conspiracy is dragged out over time, eventually it's exposed, Right? It's easy to keep a lie going for a short span of time, but as it gets dragged out over time, again, it pretty quickly falls apart. Also, among the people who are telling the story, there needs to be a significant relationship and a connection there. So typically family, in order to keep that lie together because they're mu much less likely to stand up and say and to betray their family. Um, so some kind of connection between the conspirator. And then, most importantly, little or no pressure to break the conspiracy, right? There has to be little or no pressure. Usually once some kind of real significant pressure is applied, so you're facing jail time, you're facing loss of money, you're facing whatever it might be, usually that almost inevitably breaks the lie, right? And we've all seen that on, on TV shows like Law & Order and things like that, right? Now, the resurrection of Christ has none of these features. There was not a small number of conspirators. There were hundreds and hundreds of people who were standing up and saying, Christ is resurrected, I've seen it, and it's changed me. They did not have thorough and immediate communication because they were living 2,000 years ago. And they lived in very different areas, and, and there was a lot of times they were spread out very far. And in fact, the apostles pretty quickly began to spread out and fan out across the world to preach the gospel to all these different continents and countries. So they did not have thorough and immediate communication to keep the lie going. And, and yet, of course, the story continues. Short time span, absolutely not. It's been going on for 2,000 years, right? Significant relational connections. A lot of the apostles and, and the other people who were witnesses to the resurrection had no relationships to each other. They, had, they didn't even know each other uh, in some ways, in, in some times. Little or no pressure to break a conspiracy. Again, like we just said, right, the apostles... And all these other people are eventually put to death. The people are being put to death in the, in the Roman Colosseum and so forth as well. And shortly after, right, they're being eaten by lions, all these other things. No one ever says, hey, it was all made up. Right? No one ever breaks. And, and if I'm being tortured to death for a lie, I'm going to go ahead and stand up and say, hey, I just made this up. You can stop killing me now. Please don't kill me. It was just a lie. Right? None of, no one ever says that. No one ever stands up and says that amidst torture. St. Bartholomew had his skin, who was one of the apostles, uh, had his skin flayed off like with a, with a knife, like a potato peeler. He had all his skin flayed off, right? Never once stood up and said, hey, I was just kidding. I just made it up. It was just a lie. Guys, we got together, right? So we have all this pointing to the resurrection, the reality of it, okay? Now that we, if we, hopefully we believe that the resurrection is real, right? What does the resurrection show us? All right, what is it that we can learn about the redemption of Christ by looking at the resurrection? And I think a lot of the things that we learn about, uh, about our, ourselves in, in the resurrection is about the body and, 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 and heaven and so forth. What we know is that Jesus' body was not, now his resurrected body, right, was not subject to suffering, nor was it su uh, subject to space or time. It was transcendent. It was supernatural. It's what we call his glorified body, right? He was able to pass through locked doors, right? He's able to disappear and appear and all these other things. He's, so he's not subjected to time. Um, but it also lets us see what we will be like, right? They were able to see, they knew it was Christ. So we will, we will still, in some ways, 
look like who we are, right? Other people will be able to, when we are resurrected in our glorified bodies um, and, and souls are in heaven, right? It'll still look like us, right? It still looked like him. He still had the wounds of his crucifixion. But it shows us as well that the resurrection is not just a restoration to human life. That's what happened when Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, right? Lazarus comes out and begins living his human life again. The people that Christ raised from the dead, the, 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 the children and, and, and the, the, the Christ brought back from the dead, they didn't, they didn't have glorified bodies, right? They, they just resumed their human life. The resurrection of Christ shows us that something different is in store for us when we are resurrected from, our de from the dead as well through Christ's resurrection, right? We too are destined to receive these glorified bodies and not just a return to our human state. So heaven is not going to be like a shiny earth. Heaven is going to be something on a completely different. It will still, we will still look like each other. We will still be ourselves, right? Um, but again, we will receive these glorified bodies. Also important and helpful to know that there were prophecies pointing to the resurrection. All right, and these are important. Christ made many predictions of his prophecy, or I'm, I'm sorry, many predictions of his resurrection. All right. First of all, Christ says this in Luke 18. He will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. All right, so Christ had predicted this and called this. And so we also see these being fulfilled as well. Christ stated in John's gospel that he had the power to resurrect himself. He says, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it up again. He also says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again, where it says, talking about his body. And then, and then also in the Old Testament, we see some prophecies as well. We see Jonah uh, spending three days in the belly of the whale and then coming back. We see Joseph being thrown into the pit, uh, but being pulled back out of the pit. The pit oftentimes being a symbol of death and hell. And in Psalm 16, we see, You did not give me up to hell. You did not let your godly one see the pit. You have shown me the path of life. So we see lots of different prophecies that are fulfilled in the resurrection. There are other events that, of course, take place after the resurrection. All right? We have the ascension of Christ into heaven, right? where he finally then ascends in his glorified body and returns back to the Father. He does that, and then 10 days later, we have the celebration of Pentecost. So Christ is, is resurrected on Easter Sunday. 40 days later, he ascends into heaven. And then 10 days after his, he ascends, the Holy Spirit comes down upon the apostles and upon all of us at uh, at the celebration of Pentecost, which of course for us is our sacrament of confirmation. Right? And from that moment on, even though they had been hiding and scared men um, who knew Christ but didn't want to tell other people about it, the moment the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they literally run out of the house and the locked rooms and the doors and start preaching to everybody that they can see, even the Jews who were trying to kill them and their enemies and so forth. Okay. The uh, prediction of the end and our own judgments, right? So we hear then in, in a lot of the New Testament letters then basically that Christ will come again. We will all re be judged when we die and then there will be a final judgment where everybody is brought before God and we finally hear the whole of humanity and history sort of laid out and we see God's goodness in all of its fullness, right? And we are all there together at that final judgment at the end of time. The questions for today, just a couple of them. When we say Christ descended into hell, what do we mean? Number two, according to St. Paul, how many people saw Christ after his resurrection? And then number three, write a paragraph answering how you would respond to a person who said, I think the resurrection of Jesus is made up. Okay, those are all of our questions for today. I hope and pray that you're having a great week. And if I can ever do anything for you, please let me know. Know of my prayers for you and please keep me in your prayers as well. God bless.